Hello, hello. Um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to the Festival of the Chichester event here at Chichester Festival Theatre. Um, my name's Rupert Robotham, and I'm Director of Learning and Participation uh, here. Today, we get to hear on the stage from someone who is more often read about in print about the stage, talking about someone whose breadth of interests and achievements almost covers the past 50 years of British culture. Um, Kate Bassett is uh, a British journalist and a theatre critic for The Independent on Sunday. Uh, before joining The Independent on Sunday in 2000, she worked as a theatre critic for The Daily Telegraph and The Times. Uh, her features and reviews have covered comedy, dance, books, film, opera, uh, and she's published for Time Out, uh, The New Statesman, The Times Literary Supplement, uh, and The Guardian, and The Literary Review. Um, she has chaired the Perrier Comedy Awards, which are now called the Edinburgh Comedy Awards, and been on the panel for the Verity Bargate Award for Emerging Playwrights, the TMA Theatre Awards, and Peter Brook's Empty Space Awards. And at the end of last year, she published the first comprehensive biography of Dr Jonathan Miller. In Two Minds, a biography of uh, Jonathan Miller was shortlisted for this year's Sheridan Morley Prize for Theatre Biography and the Theatre Book Prize Society for Theatre Research in the same year. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my huge pleasure to introduce Jonathan Miller by Kate Bassett. There will be some time for your questions at the end, so please do um, st store them up. Um, uh, the title, In Two Minds, uh, it, that kind of neatly captures a public perception of, of Sir, Dr. Jonathan Miller as a man with twice as many brains as the rest of us. Um, but it also intimates that there has been a duality to his life, um, first as a medical doctor and then as a theatre and opera director. But in truth, isn't, hasn't there been more than double? Uh, it's been multiple. Uh, what have been the many careers of Dr. Jonathan Miller? Um, yes, numerous. Um, most people probably know he started most famously in Beyond the Fringe, so he was a, a groundbreaking comic. Uh, Beyond the Fringe, etc., started the um, satire boom in Britain and indeed over in America in some ways. Um, so first known as a comedian, and actually even as a schoolboy, he was doing that on uh, BBC Radio, so before Beyond the Fringe, and was in the West End in Footlights Reviews before Beyond the Fringe. Uh, and then he never really wanted to be a comic. I mean, it, it sort of happened to him because he was very talented at it. Uh, and then that went from... Beyond the Fringe went from London to Broadway. And, and when he was over there in Broadway and when he came back, he essentially made a shift to director. So having trained as a medic... Uh, at university at Cambridge. He was picked up as a comic, so he went from medic to comic, and then he went from um, doctor to director. So he was a qualified doctor, but then when he came back from Beyond the Fringe, became essentially mainly, we would now think, as a theatre director going on opera director. Uh, but it's also important to remember he was a, a TV drama director. He did, uh, I think, what I think is, and a lot of other people think, is, is the best ever film version of Alice in Wonderland for the BBC, which is fantastic. Um, and it's got an amazing cast, like Peter Sellers, Michael Redgrave. Um, absolutely superb, like an art house, world-class classic, really. Uh, and did other, Plato's The Drinking Party, did various other, Whistle and I Come to You, which was a fantastic version of the ghost story for BBC as well, um, with Michael Horden. So he was a BBC drama director and also did the whole BBC... Well, he didn't. He, he ran for some years the BBC Shakespeare series, which did every single Shakespeare play as an epic project, and he ran that for several years. Meanwhile, on the science side, he also, a lot of people remember, did The Body in Question, which was another epic series about the history of medicine, which I remember watching. And I, I suspect, actually, probably, probably made my brother become a doctor. <laughs> um, I think, in retrospect, possibly. Um, so he was, he was a huge household name on TV and then became, a, and at the same time, almost was becoming a director at the National Theatre with Laurence Olivier, yeah, famous productions on Broadway with Jack um, Lemon and the then completely unknown Kevin Spacey 
in um, Long Day's Journey Into Night, um, and then huge successes at the ENO. His Mikado um, is still running. His Rigoletto, longest running shows ever. <laughs> and, and that's and that's pr and that's a huge achievement to swap between theatre and then opera because they yeah. are they are incredibly different they in their are. approaches. They are. They're now people tend to do that. That's a sort of ambition that people have now, and some people manage it. Um, for example, you could think of Rupert Gould as as is bridging slightly bridging that gap. Um, and then there, there are other things. He, he also does art. He does found object sculpture. He's a rather interesting photographer. Who had a, his photographs came out in a book called Nowhere in Particular. So he's doing that on one hand, and he's also curating major exhibitions. So he did one on, called Mirror Image about reflections in painting and how, how, how painters create reflections. If you go really close up at the National Gallery... He helped on an exhibition about camouflage recently at the Imperial War Museum. Is there any cultural matter that <laughs> he doesn't get himself involved in? Um, I've tried dance, I suppose. I've never seen him do ballet. Though actually he was apparently a really good dancer. He was a good jazz dancer as a teenager. And um, then there was another anecdote of um, the guy who runs Magnus Suggs the guy in the band Madness, was touring around Camden on a double-decker bus, and Jonathan lives in Camden. And he saw they were playing the band or on the top deck of the bus, and he was playing away. And he looked through this window in Camden, and he saw this kind of 70-year-old guy skanking away. <laughs> and then he, he was even more astounded to realise it was Dr Jonathan Miller. <laughs> so, so I take it back. He does do dance. There is no limit. Yes. Um, I, I understand this is your your first full length biography. It is. is. Yep, yeah. 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 So, so, what inspired you to pick what, Jonathan yeah. Miller? Why Jonathan Miller? Um, I suppose on a very practical level, it hadn't been done. There was one very short book of um, by Michael Moraine of, of of a couple of long interviews with him, and then little tiny interviews with lots of people he'd worked with, which was actually very informative and useful because he'd interviewed a few people who had died since then so that was that was useful but very very slim uh i think for me um as a theater reviewer it's a very fast turnover it's a kind of uh, michael billington's book of theater reviews is called one night stands and there's something really uh vivid and refreshing about that as a job so you go from one thing to the next it's never the same each night um and it's very alive for that reason and yet there's a kind of uh I think there are two levels on which your brain works. So that's extremely stimulating and immediate. But I was beginning to miss the kind of in-depth thought and in-depth research and actually getting to something, getting to grips with something bigger. Uh, and so I wanted to do that. That's why I wanted to do the book. Uh, people suggested, obviously, that I should do a biography about someone well-known in theatre. And I, I was very up for that, and obviously that's my area of expertise. But at the same time, I felt that Jonathan would be really interesting and I would learn stuff because he wasn't just that. And indeed, I did le learn lots about the history of medicine. Completely fascinating. Um, and he knows loads about philosophy. He's, he did the history of ideas and some philosophy at Cambridge as well as medicine. Um, was there any personal inspiration that, that kind of connected you with him well I suppose as a as a I was born in the late 60s so he was on tv in the late 70s and so I would be seeing him age 11 12 doing the body in question and also I knew he was doing those BBC Shakespeare's so he was around and he was obviously articulate and clever and talented and so I was very aware of him and so that was probably influential and then I did I interviewed him about 10 years before I started the book, just for a feature. And he was extremely interesting about connecting doctoring and directing and about how that's about close observations, how if you're diagnosing a patient in his, his era, it wasn't about, oh, well, I'll just stick this machine on you and see what you've got or take your blood. It was about watching the tiny details of how someone walked into a room. You know, were they kilted to the left and what did that mean? They had... Uh, or were they twitchy? Or and so so he's very good on on how that links with actually the fine tuning of directing and how really good acting is about um, you know the tiny details of someone doing that while they're anxiously thinking about something 
and he would he talks about working that into opera directing, which at the time that he started really wasn't in opera directing. It was stand and sing. You know, it's kind of, I will puff my chest out and do the aria. Uh, I'm exaggerating slightly, but he is known as having brought naturalism into opera increasingly. Um, and so that was very interesting. And so I suppose that interview, I looked back on that interview. When someone said, what, what, who do you want to write a book about? I thought, well, he would be really interesting. Did, did you find it surprising that as someone who's so unique and to reach his, what, 70th, 75th year and to have not had a biography written about him, he's so... Dis- I mean, that's quite unusual for somebody of yeah. his stature within culture, isn't it? It is. I, it, was, it was quite surprising. And yet I think he thought for a while about doing it himself earlier on. I don't know how many people had approached him or if they had or if he'd said no. Um, but he had, he, he said to me that he'd thought about writing a biography called Influences, which would be more um, concentrated on who had been his influences in his life and career. Um, the, the really interesting thing about Jonathan is that both his parents were writers, amongst other things. So his father was a, a well-known and rather famous child psychiatrist who wrote in The Listener and also wrote popular psychology books in his era and his mother was a sort of minor Bloomsbury novelist um rather good one but you know she wasn't as well known as Virginia Woolf so writer parents and yet he actually suffers from totally crippling writer's block um so you know he would have wanted to write this book but it wouldn't have been happening uh one of his it's interesting, one of his best and longest friends is longest term friends is Oliver Sacks. They were both at school together at St Paul's. And Oliver Sacks tells this brilliant story of um, when they were grown up, Jonathan had been commissioned to write a book about um, an early neurologist called Sherrington. And um, they were on holiday in Scotland, and Jonathan would go upstairs, and there would, <laughs> as the day increased, there would be sort of shouts and cries of frustration. And then he would come down for lunch and just be absolutely red faced with the struggle of having had to try and write, <laughs> which is also really strange because he's written a few short memoirs in magazines about his childhood and things, and they're absolutely beautifully written. And of course, he's, in, he's one of the most eloquent people. Of, our, of his generation, if not of the 20th century. Um, I mean, he's the chat show darling of Michael Parkinson, one of Michael Parkinson's favourite ever, and of Dick Cavett in America, who is the Michael Parkinson of America, who groundbreakingly um, had Jonathan on five nights in a row <laughs> because he was so eloquent. And was so he the, different every night? I mean, he, <laughs> they're, they're actually on YouTube if anyone wants to watch them. They're brilliantly funny and eloquent and so wide ranging. Um, but you know, it's absolutely fascinating that he has writer's block and yet is incredibly eloquent. Um, and another interesting thing further back is that as a child, he had a really bad stutter. Um, which who would get, I mean, he says it was so bad that it deformed his face and wobbled his jaw. And his parents used to have to give him extra money for the London Tube in case he could only say a, a, a station further on. Um, isn't that amazing? Um, and actually, when you know him, uh, very occasionally when I first was doing the book, so his, we didn't know each other that well, and he would ring up and instead of going, it's Jonathan or it's Jonathan Miller, he'd go, there'd be a slight pause and he'd go, it's me. And you go, that's because that's you can't say. So he, he says sometimes when he's doing something like this, instead of saying, hello, I'm Jonathan Miller, he would take a run up in the format of, hello, my name is Jonathan Miller. For some reason, that makes the slide into it easier. So it's really interesting because you just would not know that about him. No. No, I, I, just you, you started to talk about his upbringing a bit there, and and I mean that's utterly riveting to hear, kind of such high achieving parents. I mean, what what do you think that then had in terms of influence on his upbringing and and you know what were his parents yeah. like? Yeah. Um, well, the thing you know when you said why why did you want to do Jonathan Miller? And, of course, I didn't know much of that. So so there's this rather thrilling element of finding out that the the background was really fascinating as well. You know, it wasn't just him. It was his kind of ancestral family. So just to cut back a a tiny bit, one generation, 
on both sides, his, his grandparents or his grandfathers on both sides were Jewish from the Russian Pale of Settlement. I mean, it's complex, but sort of what's Lithuania now. The borders have changed, Poland, Lithuania. Both, at, roughly speaking, as sort of teenage boys fled persecution and anti-Semitism. You know, basically, they got on a boat on their own, aged between 12, one was 12, I think, and one was 18. One was trying to get to America and was told he'd got to America. It was, in fact, cork. So he, he got off, he got off, <laughs> so that was very quick. Um, he got off and became not only the sort of leader of the synagogue society in Cork, there was a, there was a large Jewish um, community there because people kept saying it was New York. <laughs> uh, so he was sort of a leading figure in the Jewish synagogue and fascinatingly really integrated and assimilated as well. So it was a mason there, played in the orchestra of Cork Opera House, I think it was. Um, so he became a leading figure and, and was, in fact, a shop owner. Uh, um, and he married a Jewish-Swedish woman of an intellectual background. So his mum was, in fact, Irish. Jonathan's mother was Irish-Jewish. And then the other father on, the, on Jonathan's father's side, the grandfather, was, ended up in the East End, uh, basically worked in sweatshops, worked his way up. His... He met his wife, who was also a Russian Jewish emigre in a sweatshop. They ended up sort of running a sweatshop themselves, and he made um, uh, beaver hats for the Queen's guards, for the Victorian guards. Uh, quite rough East End upbringing, you know, it's Jack the Ripper and appalling poverty. So he climbed up that. His son, Jonathan's father, was incredibly bright and managed from that to get to Cambridge as a scholarship boy, and then became the, basically the founding father of child guidance in Britain. He set up the first child guidance clinics um, and was well known and was you know, doing talks on BBC radio blah, 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 and worked in Harley Street by the time Jonathan was born, pretty much. So you know, this amazing kind of rise. So the mum became, they, the, the Irish family moved to London she became a very determined little young novelist uh, and got on with that. Age 22, first book published. Um, very clever. Um, Jonathan Bourne. Um, I've slightly lost where I'm going. What, <laughs> what the influence? Of, yes. Well, I mean, it's, it's just kind of heading yeah. into the kind of yeah. the exceptional cultural and, yes. and intellectual influences that yeah. were sown in at his childhood, yeah. uh, and they, and what what's riveting is that they seem to have stuck with him. They and, have, and yeah. that's that's uh, you know, yeah. Why particularly did they stick with Jonathan? Because yeah, I'm, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I would say the thing that happened. So he was born into a high powered father and a very successful mother. What's interesting? Science, art. So the dad is science. The mum is arts. And that's essentially been jo Jonathan's dichotomy and, and, in a sense, his, what's torn him in his life. Um, very indoctrinated with his father's idea that it is medicine that's all important and that science is, is the real, true way to go. Uh, and I think, I think that is actually often true of medical families. Often doctors' kids become doctors and they, they value the, that as as a career and as a... Are there any doctors in the house? <laughs> yes, very good, there we go. Is that no, it's, true? It's not going to happen. <laughs> no, I don't mean always, but, I, you know, I know a few medical families. And there's just a, there's a prizing of that as, a, as an important thing and a serious thing and an intelligent thing to do. Um, so he was indoctrinated with that. And his, I think partly the reason it stuck with him is because his dad was very successful... He believed that he had brilliant science teachers at school. He was taught by Nobel-winning scientists at Cambridge. So, you, you know, if you've been through that, you do kind of think, oh, I, I should be doing this. And also, he was very good at it, right? So, so having chucked that career in, essentially, you would feel guilty probably for the rest of your life. And he's, he's, he's said this really interesting thing that he's not... So he's, brought, he's not actually religious Jewish. He actually rejected that. 
he, his father wanted him to go through the bar mitzvah, etc. But he, he, there was a rebellion at that point. So he rejected his father's Jewishness in terms of religion, but I think not the faith in medicine as an important path to pursue. And he actually talks about feeling like a guilty Catholic when he goes past a, a hospital. You know, like he's actually kind of lost the faith. And so is, is there a sense in which, had he not had the extraordinary, I think you mentioned, cocaine-like experience mm. of Beyond the Fringe, which which must have been like the yeah. rock and roll equivalent of, yeah. you know, hitting the big... Yeah. Um, that his life might have gone a very different direction? Or was it always lurking that he would... That's, interest, that's interesting. I think um, he's, he's interesting talking about when he was at St Paul's, there was a comedy review club that he participated in, and he was he was at he was sort of mini famous as a teenager. You know, everyone in on the London circuit of kids seemed to know that he was this brilliant young comic. People in the East End went, "Oh yes, I'd heard about Jonathan Miller's impersonation of Danny Kay when he was 12. <laughs> I don't quite know how that happened. I think that was the Jewish social circuit. Um, but uh, he does talk about getting a kind of kick from that and that sense of you know the laughter beyond the the footlights and hearing the laughter and that appreciation um so i think that is quite catching but he's also interestingly fascinated by standing in the wings at those reviews and watching which is actually a very directorial thing to do you know actually preferring to be watching but still loving theater um so i think that seed was there um but um i th- <laughs> It's, I, I think that actually he took a rather different step to that cocaine snort because he didn't keep doing the stage. He actually got stage fright uh, and got his stutter back when he was doing Beyond the Fringe and actually decided he wasn't very good at comedy compared with Peter Cook, uh, which is a tough act to follow, isn't it? <laughs> um, and so he rejected that, and I, he had some really horrible um, failures, ghastly flops that actually barely got to Broadway. When he was in America, he started trying to direct commercial Broadway shows, and two of them just went belly up. So he wasn't doing the showbiz thing. Um, I think what happened was medicine at that time was a really tough ride. You know, it still is, actually. But, you know, you were expected to do the 48-hour shift for no money and get ill-treated by your superiors as some little kind of, could you, you know, what, the floor would be wiped with you, basically. And I think if, if you're suddenly in Beyond the Fringe and getting a, a, a very good wage and being applauded, I think, I mean, he would say himself that it was tempting to take the easy route. But what he didn't do, he didn't do um, comedy. He actually did something more intellectual, which was, I'm going to direct interesting classic plays. Uh, so it wasn't quite the cocaine snort of, gosh, I must be seen at the showbiz parties. So, so but you, what you seem to be describing is that beyond the fringe, that opportunity was incredibly formative because through it became yeah. a, a, a decision that he was he was more a person who sorted out and directed. Yeah. Through it, he kind of also saw Yes, his... um, yes, I think... I think Beyond the Fringe's success brought him socially, obviously, into contact with the world of entertainment. And so, the, obviously, the jobs would be turning up there. People would be offering it to him. Um, yeah, I suppose that's true. And I think just on a practical level, uh, you know, to actually go back to earning nothing would be quite hard. And, and also, it's slightly lost touch with medicine. You know, Beyond the Fringe took f- more than four years out of your life. Uh, and, you, you know, trying to keep up with science was quite hard at that point. So, so that's four, four years is a kind of terrific length of time. What, what, how does that fit in with him qualifying as a doctor in 50... Yeah, um, so <laughs> it, interesting, he'd, he'd, he'd just qualified as a doctor and he was sort of doing his first house jobs, you know, so you're still a trainee in a way, um, at UC, UCH Hospital, University College Hospital in London, and a guy turned up in the A&E ward in the evening and went, do you fancy doing a show in Edinburgh? And he, it's interesting, he treats this as a sort of the beckoning finger of comedy that tempted his fall. Um, and I think he didn't immediately say yes, but, but then met with Alan Bennett, um, Dudley Moore and Peter Cook. They were like a boy band. They were just brought together. They didn't know each other. I think 
Jonathan had seen Peter Cook once and said, oh, John, Peter, there's this guy, Peter Cook, he's good, why don't you get him as well? And they all met for this lunch um, very near the hospital with the guy who tried to bring them together. And, and so it was really awkward and difficult and sort of they didn't really like each other, according to Jonathan's version of this, but sort of agreed to it anyway. And then it snowboarded. And there was this really interesting night in, at the Edinburgh Festival. So it had just become this huge thing uh, at the Edinburgh Festival and people were queuing around the block and standing on their seats, throwing their coats in the air during the show, going, this is amazing. Um, and his, he'd married quite young uh, immediately after Cambridge. Uh, and his wife came up, Rachel, who's a doctor, uh, came up to Edinburgh and they spent the whole night walking around Castle Rock going, going if you do this, you're not going to be a doctor anymore. And him going, oh, I want to be a doctor. And her going, are you sure you want, you know, are you sure you want to do this? And, and he, he kind of said Rachel knew better than I did that this was a slippery slope. Um, what he terms a slippery slope. I mean, I don't, because I'm rather grateful that he went and directed things, but... <laughs> There's a lovely story, just moving on slightly, because obviously kind of, he then had a colossally diverse career after that. But there's a lovely story of him picking up, particularly because we're interested here in Chichester, the phone, uh, and it happened to be... Um, Lawrence Olivier. Lawrence Olivier, <laughs> yes. Which was um, slightly farcical, because um, Beyond the Fringe had... Set, Lawrence Olivier had been wanting to set up the National Centre for years, and it had been very, you know, been slow, very slow process, and was doing Shakespeare, various Shakespeare's would be done at the Old Vic and um, Beyond the Fringe included a send-up essentially of Laurence Olivier-esque and others Shakespeare sketches. <laughs> so, you know, they'd taken the piss out of Laurence Olivier. Um, and then they'd been on, Kenneth Tynan, theatre critic, had also presented this arts programme on TV called Tempo and Lance Olivier had been on, and they had been on as well at the same time as guests of Beyond the Fringe, and had all got the giggles. And Lance Olivier had just been like, oh my, you know, irritated by them. And then Jonathan had also been rude about Lance Olivier's um, black type Othello uh, in <laughs> passing to a journalist. And so there was always reasons why he thought Lance Olivier hated him. <laughs> and then um, the phone rang, and someone said, is it Lance Olivier here? And um, he, he thought it was Peter Cook taking the piss. <laughs> and so that went even more badly, because in the end, Lawrence Olivier had to go, no, 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 it really is me. Uh, and was offering him Joan Plowright, uh, his, his wife Joan Plowright, to be in, in The Merchant of Venice. So Jonathan was like, oh, yes, fine. <laughs> That's very kind of you. Yes, I will do that at the National, for the National. And then by the time it got to it, Lawrence Olivier was being Shylock as well. Uh, and it was a really, really fascinating relationship because um, Laurence Olivier was quite um, old by that time and, and quite mannered, uh, had got all his mannerisms going, you know, famous stage actor, turned up with a bag of props, including a hooked nose and ringlets and a set of buck teeth that were based on a Jewish member of the National Theatre Board. So Jonathan, you know, is not best pleased by these Jewish cliches yeah. and has to sort of get him to ditch the props bag, which were his sort of, you know, comfort blanket. But he let him keep the teeth uh, because they didn't seem particularly Jewish. And um, apparently Laurence Olivier merrily wore these around all the time and gave interviews in them uh, just to see if anyone noticed that he'd acquired massive sticking out rabbit teeth. Um, but anyway, this went well. And then actually what happened was um, Jonathan kind of resisted, unlike most directors, he was a young director came in and actually dared to resist Laurence Olivier's mannerisms. And in, in, I think it was quite tricky to start with, because obviously it was a rather challenge to the guy who's running what was essentially a the National Theatre. Um, but actually, in retrospect, Laurence Olivier said it was really good for him, and though he felt like a small, ticked-off schoolboy, in fact, it made him look in the mirror again and refresh. And actually, you can see that. I'm not suggesting only Jonathan did that, but you can see that in, in Olivier's later career. He was suddenly a really rather naturalistic film actor. If you compare that with, you know, his Richard III... He, he did actually learn to change to the style of more naturalistic acting. It strikes me the echo there between his his credit as being 
a very naturalistic opera director, and it might have been sim- quite a similar process in a way. In yeah, no, I, I think I think that's true. I think that's true. And, and actually, you know, if you look at some old footage of old actors, it is rather operatic. It is sort of, you know, they they strike poses. I, I, and as brilliant as brilliant and incisive and kind of fearless as Jonathan Miller seems to be in, as a conversationist, he still had some pretty high-profile uh, disagreements, which seem, on reflection, to have had quite a significant impact on his career. I'm, I'm kind of thinking about Sir Peter Hall. Yeah, and, yes, right, yeah. yeah. And I just yeah. wondered if you could... Yeah, no, that's, that was... I mean, the... the he slightly plays it down now, but it, it was huge. So, so Lawrence Olivier became ill and was sort of semi-retired, and then Peter Hall took over the National Theatre, which, which you know, is is a sort of notorious f- phase in British theatre history. Because I'm not suggesting this is the truth, but I, I don't quite. I don't. It's very hard to tell what the truth is about it. But lots of people think that Peter Hall was very Machiavellian. Uh, Peter Hall would fiercely counter that um but essentially what happened was peter hall came in Laurence olivier was um unwillingly sort of ousted was still in the wings but wasn't the boss anymore uh peter hall took jonathan on jonathan was a sort of unofficial associate of the national theater made him an official associate so it all seemed rather hunky-dory and he was incredibly happy and Harold Pinter was made the associate. Um, John Schlesinger was made an associate. And he was very excited that there was a new team and it was a younger team and it was all going to be more democratic. And then it all sort of went horribly wrong. Uh, and famously, um, Jonathan and um, Michael Blakemore were two associate directors. Peter Hall regarded them as the sort of enemy within, as the dogs snapping at his ankles. And... He published his diaries in 83, looking back on that, and also his autobiography, deeply critical of Jonathan and, and Michael Blakemore, as a sort of almost like waging a guerrilla war against his authority. Uh, whereas Jonathan's argument is um, that essentially <laughs> Peter Hall was Genghis Khan. Uh, there was no open government. It was all kind of cabal-like... Peter Hall says, no, Jonathan just did really bad produ- happened to do really bad productions and so was discontented. Um, Jonathan resigned, the huge blow up, and then constant fighting in the press, Jonathan bad-mouthing Peter Hall for a long time. So it was very vicious, and, and Michael Blakemore, who is on Jonathan's camp... Um, said it still regards it as a real tragedy because Jonathan was absolutely devastated for years and his confidence was kind of destroyed. Uh, and he he claims that their bad name sort of followed them and so they didn't get work for a long time and both their careers suffered. It's very hard to tell, but what was interesting researching the book was that because 30 years had passed, I could go and find letters in the end. Ent- National Theatre Archives, uh, and you know, so a very interesting example was this letter I found from from Harold Pinter, um, which actually sort of confirmed that Harold Pinter was integral to Jonathan getting not quite kicked out, but sidelined and then retiring out of the out of the battle because um, Jonathan wanted to do an all male importance of being earnest, which no one will bat an eyelid at now. You know, Oscar Wilde, did he want to write a gay play? Possibly. Would he have, would he have, was it really all about men? Um, but Harold Pinter, at, in the mid-early 70s, took great umbrage at this interpretation of the play and was like, well, what, what are you trying to imply about Oscar Wilde? <laughs> <laughs> Let me think. Um, but, it, but essentially, to be fair to Pinter, also objected to sort of mucking around with the text to that extent. You know, it's not what he wrote. Uh, but, but, but so the idea... The idea has been that Peter Hall essentially kiboshed that production, but actually there's a letter where it had been kiboshed, but then it has sort of slipped back into the possible rehearsal repertory, maybe with just Lady Bracknell as a drag act. And then there's this letter from Pintigo, I've heard on the grapevine, I talked to someone in a cafe, and they said that um, someone's still in drag as Lady Bracknell. And so, you know, actually he was integral to the final crushing of that production. And, but th- those kind of uh, machinations had 
colossal effect on what Jonathan Miller did thereafter. Yes. In the, in the sense that, yes. I mean, there were no more new writing, no more new plays that he directed after that yes. period. Yeah. He kind of went into opera. He did, it seems to all stem from that period when... Yes, it's, it was slightly fuzzier than that, but you're right, you're right, it did. It didn't have an entirely bad effect. Um, I should have mentioned one of the plays that didn't go at all well was Peter Nichols, a new play called The Freeway, which um, sunk like a stone at the National. Um, he hadn't actually done that much new writing before, but I think that was a bad experience, not just because it was new writing, but... He didn't really touch new writing after that. Um, in terms of what he did, he kind of ran away to Greenwich Theatre. Uh, it was one thing he did. Um, and he did sort of big trilogies of plays that were linked. So he did Hamlet, Ghosts and The Seagull, which, if you look at them structurally, are rather similar. They're about sons with mothers who possibly is an Oedipal relationship and the dad's gone and, and there's a sort of rival lover to the mum. So he was, he was one of the first directors to actually be using the idea of structuralism to bring a season together, which was very interesting. And he got, you know, he got Robert Stevens and he got Irene Worth out at Greenwich Theatre on the Fringe, and it was a huge thing. So actually, it was almost like this sort of mini rival to Peter Hall out at Greenwich. So he was doing that, but also he, his opera had started, but I think it, it was perpetuated. And so his opera career essentially got going with, um, well, mainly with Kent Opera, which were this tiny troupe uh, that he raised in profile because he was so such a household name on TV. People wanted to make documentaries about his opera directing. So Kent Opera was suddenly this kind of, we're going to do a big programme about your production of Kent Opera. So Kent Opera became hugely renowned. And then that led to the e &O, and that led to him actually going international. So partly what happened was... Um, Jonathan increasingly became centrifugal and went worldwide and became an increasingly worldwide opera director. But I think the National was also integral, you're right, in kind of part of the process of making him fed up with England and making him go, I'm sort of fed up with this country. Though other things there were Thatcher, Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher's arts cuts. Uh, and also he, um, he ran the Old Vic for a while uh, and was not satisfied by the reviews and felt that he's very sensitive to criticism, felt that um, that the country was negative in all sorts of ways. So Thatcher's funding was poor, the critics were negative. And so he did, he, that all that fed into his centrifugal move, I think. Kind of throughout your, your biography, what's clear is you, you marshaled kind of huge numbers of kind of anecdotes and metaphors that trying to kind of hone in on on who this this guy is. Um, and and I mean, what's brilliant, at the end, you have a sort of mini gallery of Jonathan Miller's, as it were, described in the voices of other other people. I think which which ones for you get in best? Um, I'm trying to remember what they are. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to? Shall I get yes, it in front of you? Yes. Um, you can read it out. You can read something <laughs> out to you. Well, I mean, the one particular... I mean, the one I that I one love... about Ginger. Yeah, no, you the say one which one you know. I, I, the one I love is, is his own one, uh, which, which is more kind of descriptive of, 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 of why he, he does what he does. I suppose it is true, my life does resemble a butterfly's existence, moving around from one flower to the next, but of course butterflies do pollinate. There is a point to their activity. I hope there is to mine. I just, I just love that one because it's so provocative. But then there's, 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 there's heaps of... Yeah, no, I actually really like... I mean, I think that's true. And I think one of the things to say about Jonathan is, is in many ways he's a kind of teacher. He's actually a really brilliant teacher. And actually pe people, actors talk about his rehearsals being like a really fantastic seminar. So he will come in and he won't, he won't really be going, OK, you move to the left there and say that a bit louder. He'll be going, you know, the really interesting thing about Mozart is that what was happening in art history at the time was that people wore these things and people ate this. And their gesture, you know, they gesture, their gestures like that. And look at all these pictures from that period and what was happening in terms of the French Revolution at that time. And, and so the, all these ideas will be coming in. And then they'll just be sort of absorbed and feed in. You know, this is the, these are the actors who love working with him. They'll say it's like a kind of great seminar. And also 
very funny. He will be doing sort of jokes and joke impersonations of the character that you then take away and are slowly absorb and then it comes out in subtle ways. Um, so I think he's a teacher and I think that's why he's very good. You know, the body in question was very good. He was a teacher of the history of science. Uh, and I think, I think what's interesting is that as a teacher, what he's brilliant at is that butterfly thing. Because he's science, arts, he knows about art history, he knows about the history of ideas, he knows about philosophy. He's really good at connecting and he's, he's brilliant at metaphors and similars. So in the body in question, he would go, um, I'm trying to think of something. He, he would just have vivid similars. He would go, uh, he would be doing a post-mortem and he'd go, oh, here's the intestine. It's like a huge Amazon running through the body. Or he'd go and uh, he'd be describing the, um, the ends of your nerves through the body. He'd go, it's like, it's like your body is embroidered with a thousand, a million seed pearls. You know? And so he's just very good at going, I'm working on something scientific, but I will find another metaphor that will be more vivid to people. And so the, the butterfly thing is brilliant because he'll go, oh, I'm doing science, but I can, I can draw on an... Or he'll go um, on a tiny insect, all the cilia, the little hair on the body of a water insect uh, so that makes it move along. He will go, it's like Van Gogh's picture of the wind across a cornfield. And you go, right. It, it makes him also not sound so gloomy because in, in yeah. recent times he, he has kind of tended to annihilate a lot of his achievements and that and that feels r wrong when you look at the substantial kind of achievement yeah. and and I love that description someone was describing him as a bit of, you know throwing suspension cables between disciplines yeah. Yeah. and that idea of him being something of a cultural architect someone who's actually and and throwing things out there so that we might all kind of connect a bit more with other areas of the life I think he's so I think he's narrow. I think essential I mean he's a he's a divided man and he has been divisive in you know situations like Peter Hall but actually what, what's really valuable about him is he is a great connector and he's a great connector of the arts and sciences and actually in his teenage years that was a big thing C.P. Snow did this big lecture about the two cultures which was why are the arts and sciences so divided and he has been like this prime figure who has bridged the gap and and helped others want to bridge the gap and actually you can what's interesting is you can now see that happening i think via the welcome trust there's this the welcome trust is essentially a medical body hugely rich they're now funding loads of theater and there's now loads of theatre about medicine. In a way, you kind of think that Jonathan should be, <laughs> should, be <the laughs> should be doing this stuff. Be. But, but that's very fascinating that now there are more theatre people f doing plays about neurology. Um, partly, you know, Peter Brook did Oliver Sacks's um, piece about um, the man who mistook his wife for a hat. So, you know, that's another example of a theatre person working with um, a psychologist, neurologist... Um, in a moment's time, I'm going to kind of throw open and see if we've got any questions from the audience. Could we have the house light up? If, and because and, and, that would be brilliant, so we can all see each other a bit more. Just, um, just in terms of these, the one I remembered was um, when you're saying about him being negative. I mean, he 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 is often negative nowadays and sort of disappointed, and will is often quoted in the press being critical about things. But um, one of his friends, Carl Miller. So he just, I just really like this. He's like ginger. He G'd people up. And he did. And he was also absolutely, he, and still is, brilliant at when he's excited by younger people with talent, he will get them in and he will create this little sort of brains trust. And he'll get people going and he will encourage younger talent. And he loves, he loves fringe work and he loves working with like young singers on masterclasses. So he, still, he does still have that G'ing up thing. When he gets going on it. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, would you uh, have, there, have there been any points of contact that you want to ask Kate about? And kind of given this fact, I've got hundreds more questions, so don't feel you have to. But um, yes, in the past. Uh, you spoke a lot about his success. How did he go for COVID? Um, that's interesting. Well, I think in in two opposite ways from my, my experience. Um, he is really hypersensitive and admits this. I mean, says this himself about criticism 
and critics. I mean, the, the flip side of that is he's actually said, I, I like to be under a Niagara of praise. Um, and, and that rather interestingly ties in with his feelings that he was underloved by both his parents, that they were both sort of rather cold and detached, um, whether or not that's true or whether or that's true of sort of parents in that period as well. But that he, he very much felt that. And so I think there's a sort of link there that as soon as the critics lay into him, there's a sort of raw nerve of nobody loves me. Um, and so copes really badly on that level and will go into great glooms. Um, one of his kids that, who remembers being a teenager and he's, he used to do a newspaper round and he came and he got all the reviews of some show. He came back and he put them on his dad's bed and this was like depression for a week. It's like, oh no. Um, the other thing is though that when he really thinks he has done something crap, and he will admit to that. He's actually quite funny about it. You know, he will go, that, oh, that was a complete disaster. I am a complete disaster at writing. Or So he's not, you know, he's not unself-critical, but he will also have that defensive thing when he thinks something's good and it's been slated very, very much angry about that and is incredibly rude about lots of critics. So Peter Hall's comment that uh, he's the only director I've met who, who likes all of his own work is not terribly fair. Um, you could get that impression. There's, there is this sort of not two minds, but there are two sides that, that when he's defending something or when he's proud of something, he, he will say it in a way that in some ways is rather un-British. Um, perhaps not now, but old school British. Um, you know, one person he directed with works, yes, he just has this mantra of saying, it's the best thing I've ever done. Um, which, interestingly, his own mum, in a letter, said about one of her books, she said, this, is the, this will be the best book that Victor Gallant has ever published. Exactly the same phrase. Um, but um, Michael Blakemore, the, the associate at the National, when he was associate director at the National, said specifically said about that Peter Hall comment that said it isn't true and actually he's not always confident. But you read sometimes of actors saying I am the greatest actor in the world as a way of geeing themselves up. Do yes, you think that... I, I think I think that's part of it. I think that is part of it. And I, I also I also think that people who seem very arrogant often have a very soft underbelly somewhere, whether it's well hidden or not. It's a hard, it is also a really I mean, I'm a critic, and so I know I'm on the wrong side of the fence here, but I do, I do think it's a really hard profession to be in. It's not, there's not many professions where you're publicly criticised for what you do. And everyone's opening the paper and going, oh, right, that wasn't very good then. You know, most of us don't have to do that on a daily work basis, do we? Any other questions? Yes, please. Can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with biographer and subject? subject. Um... So I, I met him for this first interview when I was 20-something, uh, liked him, went back 10 years later. Well, I wrote and I said, yeah, I'm thinking of writing a biography. Do you want, do you want it to be about you? <laughs> uh, and I, was, I think I was slightly vetted. So I went round um, to his house and it was just sort of, you know, do you want a coffee? But his wife and one of his kids was there. So I think I was being slightly, but in a very nice way. And at the end, he, he just went, OK, then. Um, so I'm assuming he kind of trusted and liked me. Uh, the process, um, essentially, he's, he's very kind of relaxed. His home life is kind of, you know, there's just a big kitchen with a big kitchen table. So I would go around with a recorder and a notepad and he would ask him, essentially questions about everything I could find he'd ever done in his life, and he would answer. So he was incredibly generous and incredibly eloquent and had fantastically viv unusually vivid memories of childhood and everything. So that was brilliant. Uh, and then I would go off and research lots of archives and things as well. So he's very generous. Um, the rather extraordinary thing is that I said early on, Obviously, I, I, I can't really write this. I don't want to write this eulogy of you. I'm not really interested in that. I'm going to put some critical things in, which he sort of took on the chin, pretty much. Uh, and he said, I'm not going to read your book. 
which was a blessed relief, actually. I mean, I was thinking about that at the end. I was thinking, well, any normal biography is kind of, you know, authorised, which essentially means they've ploughed through it and gone, I don't like that bit, I don't like that bit. Uh, and I don't think I could have written it, actually, or it would have been just awful, you know, because essentially I'm a critic, so what I'm interested in saying about things is this is good or this isn't good or this is just interesting about this, make of it what you want. Um, and so essentially that's what I apply to things I look at, including the subject of the biography. Um, he did want to check the science stuff, which was fine. And he, he did just want to check what I'd said about one close friend who I won't name, but one close family friend. So I showed him that, which was a slightly terrifying moment. And I suppose he, you know, some of it was critical and I sort of sat there while he read it. But he took that on the chin as well. It didn't change anything. Uh, and then the, one of the most... And it, essentially, he's very, it's very sweet, and I would go around for lunch occasionally um, with him and his wife. Uh, and I would sit in lots of his rehearsals. He'd be very keen that I would go and watch you know, his rehearsals um, sometimes around the world, sometimes just in London, which was actually really interesting because he did get to see how he directed. Um, I think possibly the worst moment was when the book came out and I went round to his door, rang on the bell and went, there you go. And we both sort of stood there looking slightly ashen. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, allegedly, he still hasn't read it. His wife read it. Um, and there is... So, quite a lot of critical voices in it because he, you know, he's had the Beatles things and things. Um, but she luckily liked it as a book um, and so he's fine with it. Um, so that's sort of, you know, that's, that's essentially it. And I, you know, there have been, there were phases for me where it was, I just think, oh God, can you just stop doing more work? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I just, the book's going on and on now. Um, there is a rather brilliant innovation that I haven't seen on many biographies, but there is a there is a, there are nine different chronologies at the back of all of his different careers, and I can't imagine you could do that with many people. No, I mean I suppose that's what I meant at the start. Is why I did it, you know, because there's the this is his artwork. These are his scientific papers on on neurosurgery. This is his theatre staff. This is his performance stuff. And, you know, that's sort of how you think about a career, but actually the way I structured the book was... It, I found it more interesting to do it linearly because you'd go, oh, that's really interesting, he's directing Hamlet and is, according to the cast, obsessed with the father's ghost just as his dad is dying. And just as his, after his dad has died, he goes, I'm not doing theatre anymore, I'm going back to science. You know, literally, you know and, and so the linear thing is interesting, but then you can't structure it as... These are. This is the comedy story, and I think that's less interesting. So I kind of did that. What was the platform like at the National Theatre when you would you were you and he were together? That was fine. I think I think we were both. I think we were both quite tense about that. It was the only one we did together. Um, Partly because he hadn't read it, you know. So it's kind of this weird situation. So essentially, I, really, I was I was talking to him about his career. It was more like, you know, a, plat a platform talk where I was talking about his career. But um, it was fine. It was fine in the end, but there was, you know, we were slightly off stage going, well, you're not going to ask me about my family, are you? <laughs> um, but it, it, he's, he's very good and he's, he's, you know, he still shines because you'll ask him a question and firstly he'll spiel fascinatingly about the ideas behind the production or he will have some fantastic anecdotes about famous people. Any last questions? Yes. Yes, because he's so multi-talented, I suppose he's able to have that butterfly career. You know, he's able to go, oh, I'll go make a programme about science now instead. Um, 
I think it depends how you look on it. I think, um, actually, that, that gallery of comments, um, you know, people who love him and have known him for years, there are people going, if he were French, there would be streets named after him, which there would be, actually. Um, or uh, Michael Wood, who, you, you know, shakes um, the, the historian and TV presenter, um, was one of his young actors in A Twelfth Night and has known him since. And, you know, he says, you know, he gets absolutely slagged off, but the people who slag him off, most of them can't hold a candle to him. So, but then again, he's had an awful lot of praise as well. I mean, I think, I think um, his, he does tend towards the glass half full view of life. And in, in many ways, he's had an absolutely wonderful career and fantastic opportunities. And actually emerging in the 60s was brilliant for him because it, as opposed to dumbing down now, and as a, it was brightening up. And so he was perfect for the BBC at that point. You know, the opportunities were, the, were, the doors were open. Um, and I think on a good day, he will, he will say, you know, it was brilliant and I've had a good time. And he loves actors, he loves working with actors. And he's had heaps of praise and heaps of awards. Um, but, the, but there is a school. You know, it was, it was actually really interesting when this book came out. There was one of the um, tabloids that is very anti him just went through it with a fine tooth comb and picked every negative thing, like every negative thing out and that was the book review and I was like so you didn't ever do anything good and it, that was an interesting moment because you know I kind of went actually that does happen to you that's just someone wanting to really rub your nose in it um and, the, and I think there is that side of British life and there is that side of too clever by half, which he himself cites as a phrase frequently used. But then again, there are people who are like, God, thank God he's so clever. You know, and thank God he was out there doing stuff. I wish that was true now in today's dumbed down culture. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I, 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 it's been completely riveting reading this and uh, I do hope you'll all pick up a copy outside. There are uh, uh, copies for In Two Minds. Thank you very much to Kate Bassett. For <laughs>